Well, I've already read for you the text, so let's just go ahead and dive into what we're looking at this morning. Remember, this morning we're looking at the resurrection. And as I've already told you, the resurrection is the proof that God has given to us that He has accepted Christ's payment. Now, every year I like to point out that this event, the resurrection, is so important that God did not give us just one day each year to commemorate it. He's actually given us 52 days per year, uh, every Lord's Day. Remember, Jesus rose on the first day of the week. That's the reason why we call this uh, the Lord's Day. This was the day when His humiliation came to an end. Remember, His humbling Himself in order to become our servant, which includes His incarnation, uh, his, his life, His suffering, His dying on the cross, His burial. They were all a part of His humiliation, His humbling Himself in order that He might raise us up. But this was also the day, you see, when His exaltation began, His rising from the dead. His ascending into heaven, which happens 40 days later. His sitting at the right hand of the Father, the beginning of His reign over all things for the good of His church, which will end when He comes again to judge all mankind. That's also a part of the, uh, the exaltation of Christ, that He has been given the honor of, of judging everyone who has ever lived on that final day. And that's also because of that event. It's also important that we listen to what he has to say in his word about the gospel because this is the only way that we can escape it. Now, this day marks also the completion of his work of the new creation. It's the day that he entered into his rest. And that's why it's called the Lord's Day. That's why he calls us today also to rest from our work and to worship him on this day because today, he holds out to us by way of a picture, so to speak, of that promise of eternal rest that we have in heaven. Uh, he wants to remind us from week to week that that rest is ahead of us and it, it is possible to enter it and we have entered it if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that rest is ours, but we know we are certain that one day it will be ours uh, in, its, in its totality, in its reality. Now, something else we also do every Lord's Day, which I believe the early church also did, but which very few churches actually uh, do, and I, I, I think our Lord calls us to do this, is to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which you can see we have set before us this morning. I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but the Lord's Supper, I, you, you've thought of this, I'm sure, it, it commemorates the death of Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. I think the Lord wants us to remember every Lord's Day that act, which is kind of the summary of everything that Jesus has done in order to save us, that He died for our sins. But let's not forget, too, that um, the Lord's Day is the day in which He rose from the dead. So every Lord's Day, the Lord, I think, wants us to remember the two things upon which our salvation depend, the fact that He paid the price for our redemption, the Lord's Supper, and that His payment was received. He was raised from the dead so that we will be reminded every Lord's Day that we are safe if we have trusted in Him. Well, that's what I want us to focus on this morning is, again, God's redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to see it under basically four points. I want us to look, first of all, at who gave the price of redemption. Secondly, who paid the price of redemption. Thirdly, that the payment was received, and this is where we're going to focus on the resurrection. And then fourthly, that through this, we can know that we who have trusted in Christ are redeemed. Okay, so let's begin by looking, first of all, at who gave the price of redemption, and we know that that is God the Father. Let me read to you probably the, the best-known verse in all the Scripture, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I really believe that to appreciate what it is that Jesus says here, we need to understand our situation, what it was like when we came into the world, because by world here, Jesus is not referring to a world of perfect people, but He's speaking of the fallen world. Remember when God first made man, 
He placed him in the garden under a test to see if he would obey him. And Adam failed that test. Uh, that's something we, we, I don't know how often we hear that in churches today. But Adam represented all of us in the garden, himself and all of his children, and that means us. And he failed that test. And we also failed it in him. And that is why we come into the world the way that we do. That's the reason why the world is in the situation that it's in. Paul writes in Romans 5, 19, through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. If, if you ever look at the history of the world, whether it's recent history or current events, I think you can see this is true. Even when you consider your own experience in this world, why is it that everyone is doing the things that are wrong? Why is there so much hatred, so much warfare in the world? Why is it that our children, those of us who have children or have had children, raised children, we recognize this pretty quickly. As soon as they're able to express themselves, they begin to do the wrong thing. They begin to disobey us. Why do all of our children disobey us? Why do we all disobey? Well, it's because we are the children of Adam. Paul says, the many were made sinners because of the one man's disobedience. To be a sinner means to be one who is disposed towards doing the wrong thing. Now, we also came into the world guilty. Paul also writes, through one transgression, that same sin of Adam, there resulted condemnation to all men. And that means, of course, that we are under the sentence of destruction. Now, we're guilty, okay? Not just because of what Adam did, but also because of what we have done. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as he also tells us in chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but spiritual death, which is eternal death, which the Bible says is the second death, which is the lake of fire, which is that place that we do not want to go to. And if anybody understood really what it was, they wouldn't want to either. Okay, now God is holy, which means he loves what is good perfectly. And because he's holy, he must also be just, which means he must also punish that which is unholy, that which is sinful. And so as we come into this world, we're all born guilty, under condemnation, on our way to punishment, on our way to hell, a fiery hell, very, very unpleasant place. We need redemption, okay? We need to be freed from this debt. And that's what makes the gospel good news. That is what Jesus was telling us about in John 3.16, that God's love for fallen mankind was so great, so infinitely great, that he was willing to give that which was most precious to him. And that is his most beloved son, his only begotten son, the price. He was willing to give the price of our redemption so that whoever believes in him, and again, I think sometimes we don't understand exactly what that means to believe in Christ. It doesn't mean just or merely to believe he existed, that he is God's son, that he did everything that we're going to see that he did in order to save. James tells us the devils believe that, but they're not saved by it. Believing is more than just believing facts. It's also trusting. It's looking to Jesus and what he has done to be the only reason why God should let us into heaven, the only reason to, that we might be acceptable to him is because of what Jesus Christ has done. We need to trust what Jesus has done to save us and not what we have done, not even in our trusting him, so to speak, you know, as an act by which maybe God sees that we're good enough to save. Some people believe that that's what faith is, something we do that God looks at as an act of obedience, and then he says, oh, well, okay, you're righteous because you've trusted in my son. No, it's as we trust in Jesus, we are clothed in his righteousness and our sins are taken away and we are made acceptable in him. He is our only hope of heaven. And Jesus tells us that if we trust him to get us into heaven, he will save us. We will not perish. We will not go down into eternal 
punishment, but we will have eternal life, which is not just endless life, though it is that, but it is a relationship with God, one that will last forever in heaven with Him. And heaven is a wonderful place, not because the streets are paved with gold and we have, you know, these, this huge golden building. I mean, if we think of heaven in those terms, we're really not thinking of, uh, of what makes heaven precious. What makes it precious is there's no more sin. And we're filled with the Spirit of God fully. And we get to see God and we get to see the Lord Jesus Christ seated at His right hand. And I'm not saying that Jesus isn't God. We understand He is God and man. But we see the beatific vision. And that is our ultimate blessedness. But that's, you see, what is made possible by God the Father who is the one who gives us a son. But secondly, let's consider who paid the price of redemption, what the price is that he paid, and that is the Son of God. Now, the one who would make this payment had to be God himself. We don't want to miss that point. By the way, this is a very good point to bring up to Jehovah's Witnesses as they come to your door. Why do you believe that Jesus is God as well as man? Well, it's because the Bible says so. But, but why does he have to be? Well, it's because the debt that we owed God was infinite. Okay? Infinite means it's just limitless. Uh, there's no end to the guilt of sinning against one who is so infinitely holy and infinitely precious and worthy as God. To sin against him is to commit an infinite crime and the only one who could have paid this debt was God himself. So one thing you can point out to a Jehovah's Witness, and you should point out to yourself, is that God accepts the, the payment of this one man for those who are guilty of infinite sin. But let's not forget, he also accepts the payment of this one man for a multitude, which no man can number, that are redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ. And how can God do that if this is just a creature? Okay, he must be worthy. He must be God. Only one with that infinite worth could pay this. And so the Son of God comes to pay it. But in order to pay it, he had to be one of us. Okay, we're the ones who owe the debt. We are the ones who sinned against God in Adam and also by ourselves as we come into the world. And so the Son of God, we read in the Bible, was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin. I realize this is a Christmas message, but um, it is part of the, of the gospel. And he was born of her without any sin and without any guilt. And being one of us, there were two things he needed to do. He had to obey his father perfectly. He had to obey the commandments. He had to obey the law of love so that he could give us a perfect righteousness, a perfect record of obedience as we trusted him. But he also had to die. God says the wages of sin is death. Jesus took our guilt on himself. If we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus took the guilt of everyone who would trust in him on himself on the cross and he died in our place, not just physically, but judicially. And again, this is something else that we often miss, and that is that Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, suffered hell on the cross, not just the physical pain of, of the, uh, you know, the spikes in his hand and also the abuse he had taken on his body. You ever stop to think about why Jesus, when he was praying in the garden, on the night before, or the night he was betrayed, but the night before his crucifixion and so forth, why it is that he was sweating drops of blood? Why so much duress? Why so much stress? Was it just because of the crucifixion? I mean, that wouldn't be very pleasant, but there were others who were crucified also, and we don't read about them sweating blood. The reason why Jesus was under such duress was because he was looking ahead. As Jonathan Edwards reminds us, he was looking into the fiery furnace. He was looking at the hell that he was going to have to endure on the cross as our sins were laid on him and the Father punishes him for our sins and that's what made him sweat blood. He was praying for the strength to be able to endure this. And so our Lord Jesus Christ takes our guilt and in taking our guilt, he takes our curse upon himself, the curse of God for the broken covenant that Adam had broken and we had all broken that would have plunged us into hell forever. And he dies in our place. And then, of course, after he died, he was 
buried. Now, R.C. Sproul tells us that the bodies of crucified men, typically, were thrown into the Valley of Hinnom, which is a, a picture of, of hell. Uh, it's that when Jesus is describing the, you know, the fires of hell the, where the uh, fire doesn't go out and so forth, he's, he's using the Valley of Hinnom, which is essentially a trash dump where they burn their trash as a picture of that. Typically, those who were crucified, because they're considered criminals and under a curse, are thrown into the Valley of Hinnom and they're burned. But Jesus was not treated that way. We know that Jesus, his body was treated with respect and honor because of his followers who knew who he was, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And they came to Pilate and they asked for his body and they laid him in a tomb and treated him with respect. So Jesus died and he was buried. Now again, pause for just a moment to consider how great Jesus' love is for his own people. He didn't owe this debt. Uh, he didn't owe our infinite debt. He what is the ever-blessed one. He, he didn't have to suffer hell on the cross, but he was willing to, to pay this price. And remember, this price was being paid all throughout his life. He, he came into a sinful world. He had the one who was, you know, who had known the, the, the blessings of heaven and that perfection came into a world of sinful man and had to be around and put up with people, you know, that hated one another and people who were doing evil things. So he was in a world of sinful humanity. Remember how uh, Peter describes Lot when he's in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and how his righteous soul was being tormented by their wicked deeds. Well, just think about Jesus and what he must have experienced uh, being among a sinful people for those 33 and a half or so years. And then to suffer at the hands of the wicked, uh, not only the hatred of his own people and the, the persecution of the Pharisees, but when he was handed over to the Romans to be abused and to be mocked and scourged and then to be nailed to the cross and then even further to suffer hell. And he did all of these things out of love that he might free us from judgment because he knew there was no way that we could go free except he make this he paid this price. Remember how he prays in the garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup, this cup of suffering which you're giving me to drink, let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus, because there was no other way that we might be saved, was willing to drink that cup and go through that suffering out of his love for us. So the Father gives the, the price of our redemption, and Jesus comes and pays the price. But thirdly, how do we know that this payment was received? Well, Paul tells us in our passage. He tells us, first of all, that um, you know, he's addressing a problem in the church of Corinth. There were those who were denying the resurrection, that it was even a possibility. And that was not an uncommon thing. Remember, before Paul came to Corinth, he was in Athens on Mars Hill, and he was preaching the gospel to the philosophers there. And they were listening to him until he mentioned the resurrection, that this Jesus who died was also raised from the dead, and then they began to mock him. They did not believe such a thing was possible. And I think, you know, for most people today, if you were to ask them, they might agree. Resurrection, once, once a person dies, they're, they're dead, especially if it's been three days. But Paul tells us otherwise. Paul says, I know it's possible because I have seen him. And not just me, but many others also saw him. You know, before the advent of, of the, um, uh, the Android phone, <laughs> where everybody has their cameras, you know, everybody's got their, their video up almost instantly to, whenever something happens. Before the advent of that, how would you prove something like this actually took place? Well, the only way you could was through eyewitnesses. And God says in his word for you know, eyewitnesses to be listened to, there has to be at least two or three. Well, how many has the Lord given us? He's given us over 500, and, and over 500 who saw him at one time. Now, Paul tells us that Jesus first appeared to Cephas, and that's Peter, then to the 12, and, and that's simply used to, to refer to the disciples because at that time there were really only 11. When they were gathered together, remember Jesus appears to them after his resurrection, then he appeared to over 500 at the same time. Then to James, the brother of the Lord. 
then to all the apostles again before his ascension, and then finally he appeared to Paul. Now, why is Jesus appearing to, to these people? Uh, why did he appear to Paul? Why was that important? Well, it's important because he wanted them to be his witnesses of the fact that this has taken place. Peter said to qualify to be an apostle, you had to see the risen Lord. And the reason is because the apostles were to be his witnesses, the witnesses of his resurrection. And how could they testify to that if they had never seen him alive after he had died? Well, that's why Jesus appears to Paul when he called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, how do we know these testimonies are true? Well, of course, if we have the Spirit of God within us, we know that He bears witness to our spirit that what the Word of God says is true, and that is our absolute assurance. But we also know there are ways to look at it more objectively, and we've been considering those in the evening. We've been looking at how even if the Bible was not God's Word, it could still be reliable history. And we believe it is reliable history because two of the greatest archaeologists who have ever lived, William F. Albright and Sir William Ramsey, both testified, one to the accuracy, amazing accuracy of the Old Testament, and the other to the accuracy of the New. There is no reason to suspect that these accounts are fictional, but that they are accurate records of eyewitness testimonies of more than 500 people who saw Jesus Christ alive. Now, to get to the main point, why is it important that Jesus actually be alive, that he be raised from the dead? Well, Paul argues in our passage that if he had not been raised from the dead, salvation would not be possible. If there's no resurrection, he says, Jesus has not been raised. If Jesus has not been raised, then our faith is worthless. We would still be guilty of all the crimes that we have committed against God. And everyone, he says, who has fallen asleep, and what he means by that, of course, is who's died, they would have perished. And he says, if we have this hope of Christ, which is a false hope, we would be of everyone in the world most to be pitied because we're so deceived. Now, think about this for a moment. Why, why is that the case? You know, what's the connection between the resurrection and the forgiveness of sins? Why did Jesus have to be raised from the dead? Well, remember, Jesus took our guilt on the cross so that he could suffer and die to satisfy God's justice for us. Why did Jesus die? What put him in the grave? What killed him? God's justice against our sins put him in the grave. Now, if Jesus had not been raised, that would mean that his payment was not enough. His payment was not accepted. Our sins would still be holding him down, holding Jesus down in the grave. They would not be forgiven, which means you and I would still be guilty. And we would still be looking forward, though not, you know, not favorably, to having to pay for those things ourselves. The point of the resurrection is that this payment was received. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So we... We have what he's saying here is that Adam killed us all, the first Adam. But the second Adam gives us life if we are trusting in him. The Father gave the payment, the Son made the payment, and the resurrection proves that the payment was received, that it was enough. And God the Father has accepted what Jesus has done on our behalf so that we can go free, we can be with him forever. Now, finally, let's consider what this payment actually purchases. Jonathan Edwards, if you've never heard that name before, I know those of you who are here all the time are familiar with that, um, with, with him, was perhaps the greatest pastor, theologian that America, while it was still a colony, an English colony, produced. And uh, he's written quite a bit, and we can learn quite a bit from him.
as he looks at the scriptures and tries to understand what they're saying. Now, he wanted us to understand that in this work of redemption, all three persons of the Trinity are equally involved. Okay, I've been emphasizing the Father is the one who gave us the price. He, he gave us his Son. The Son is the one who comes and, and pays the price in the way that we've seen. But how is the Spirit involved? Well, the Spirit, as we know, is the one who applies what Jesus Christ has done to us. And that's, okay, the Father gives the price, Jesus pays the price, and the Spirit takes what Jesus did and applies it. That Edwards, as he was thinking about this, thought that that kind of doesn't leave room for the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, it doesn't really do justice to what he does. So what we need to see instead is that by doing the work that Jesus Christ has done, he has actually purchased the Spirit, so to speak. He has made it possible for the Spirit to return. Uh, so he is what is purchased, okay? So the Father gives the price, the Son pays the price, and the Spirit is what is purchased, his return into our hearts. Now, Jesus redeemed us from God's justice so that we can go free but this also made it possible for him to give us the Holy Spirit. Adam lost the Spirit because of the fall for all of us. But the second Adam, when it says he becomes a life-giving Spirit, it's referring to the fact that he gives us the Holy Spirit to make us alive again. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the love that he creates in us that moves us from enemy to God to one who wants the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Now listen again to what Paul says of his own experience in our passage in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. He says, after he says, least, you know, last of all he appeared to me, he says, for I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Now, this grace that he's referring to is it's used in a couple of different terms. I mean, he's saying that God, out of his measureless love, has, has towards Paul, in calling him, did not prove vain, but then when he says that he labored more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God. He's referring to that particular grace of the Holy Spirit who not only changed his heart, but gave him the zeal to live for God's glory. Paul writes in his first, well, in his letter to the Philippians that before Christ changed his heart by his spirit, he was bent on destroying the church. Like, like many of his contemporaries, contemporary Pharisees, he thought Jesus was an imposter. And that to be true to God, he had to destroy everything that Jesus actually stood for. But while he was on his way to Damascus, remember, with letters from the high priest to, to imprison any Christian he should find there and bring them as prisoners back to Jerusalem for trial, Jesus appeared to him. And Paul asks him who he was. He says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then he says, what do you want me to do? And he sends him into the city. And he was later told that he would be Jesus' messenger to the Gentiles. And that in doing this, he would suffer many things. The one who caused the church much suffering would now be the one who would suffer much in order to advance the church. But the question is, what changed his mind? Was it the fact that he realized he was mistaken? Jesus really is the Messiah? Well, there are a lot of people who saw Jesus and his miracles and who were completely unchanged but were actually even more hardened by the fact that they saw it. They still denied him. Was it just simply the miracle that changed his heart? No, it was the Holy Spirit who changed his heart from hatred to love. Paul gave himself for the rest of his life unstintingly, no matter what the price even when he was in jail, uh, in prison, because of his preaching the gospel and he saw how it affected other people, how it encouraged them to preach Christ, he says, I I'm glad I'm in prison so that Christ would be preached by more people. His whole life was wrapped up in the glory of Christ. He loved Christ when before he hated him. 
And that's because of the Spirit's work. Jesus said to Nicodemus, remember, in John chapter 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And I don't think he means by water there, water baptism. We know that we're not saved by water baptism. But I think he's referring to the Word. You have to hear the Word. And then the Spirit of God has to quicken you to life. As Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But it's the Spirit who makes that word powerful. The Spirit must make us alive before we can see the kingdom of God in Christ and enter into that kingdom through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the point is that that is now possible because... The Father gave the price, His Son. The Son paid the price. He lived and He died. And the payment was received. He was raised again from the dead. And now He can give His Holy Spirit so that we can trust in Him, so that we will not perish. Now, we do believe that He was doing this in the Old Testament. There were people who were saved in the Old Testament. But that's because what Jesus did was being applied backwards in time to the Old Testament. If Jesus had not done this, then no one in the Old Testament could have been saved either. So this morning, as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper, let's remember that God so loved the world that He gave His Son to live and to die and to rise again so that we might have life. But remember, It doesn't happen automatically. We must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We must rely upon Him and Him alone for our acceptance with God. And let's not forget as well what the Bible says. The evidence will be if we really have trusted Jesus. It's not that we go on our way and say, I'm so glad that I'm not on my way to hell any longer and I have heaven to look forward to. Now let's go see what I can get from the world and enjoy life as much as I can, knowing that I've got my fire insurance policy. That's not the way it works. But those who truly trust in the Lord, who have the Spirit of God in their hearts, the work of sanctification, the Spirit begins to work within us to make us more like Christ right away. I mean, we don't become exactly like Him right away, but He begins that work right away. He begins to clean up our our lives and transform us into the image of Christ so that we see ourselves more and more pursuing the things that Jesus would pursue if he were living our lives. We're becoming more and more like him. So as we prepare to come to the table, we do need to examine our lives to see if, if, if that, that evidence of the Spirit's work is in our lives. Are we trusting Jesus and him alone? Are we repenting of our sins? Repenting means that we're, you know, we stop doing the, the wrong and hateful things. But it also means we begin doing the right and loving things. And that's becoming less like us and more like Jesus Christ. As we know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 that we do need to examine our lives because um, if we come to the table and we're not repenting of our sins, then... Remember what happened to the uh, Corinthians that were, they, they were committing some pretty serious sins. And then coming to the table and how the Lord was disciplining them. That tells us that we need to examine our lives before we come to the table. And we need to think about whether, again, we're trusting Him, whether we're following Him, whether we're repenting of all of our sins and putting on all the duties our Lord calls us to do, the duties of love, before we come to the table. And, and if we are, doing these things, if we see that work of grace in our lives, our Lord calls us to come in order that we might receive more of His grace, more of His help to be able to do what He calls us to do, to live as He calls us to live. So let's bow for just a moment of prayer and let's ask for the Lord to prepare us uh, to come to His table.